Reactor online. Sensors online. Weapons online. All systems nominal. Hey everyone, B1B Flyer here. In this video, I'm going to show you how to tackle yellow using basic techniques that even beginning painters can employ to get a great looking yellow result on your Battletech miniatures. Here's the primary paints I'll be using today from the Viejo model color line, Deep Yellow, Ice Yellow, Gunmetal, and for the game Extra Opaque line, Heavy Charcoal. I'll also be using the Army Painter Quick Shade Soft Tone Wash. For brushes, I'll be using a number three Low Kernel Synthetic, a Games and Gears Pro Studio 4RX Sable, a quarter inch round makeup brush for dry brushing, and a Monument Hobbies Bombwick Synthetic Zero Brush for detail. Ahead of time, I've primed my miniature using Viejo Gray Airbrush Primer. You can just as easily use any aerosol primer that you normally use, as long as it's white or a very light gray. You don't want to get too dark as we'll be applying the yellow directly over this and we don't want that to dim down the color. After thoroughly shaking the bottle, I've added some paint to my palette paper, and because my paint's a little bit thick, I added some water to it. We're doing a base coat, and the goal here is to want to be able to do two coats without reducing the detail on the miniature. And what I mean by that is you don't want the paint so thick that you're feeling that it's done and you can just get away with doing one. The paint's probably too thick when it comes to yellow as far as base coats are concerned, if you can cover everything with one thick coat like that. It's better to have a thin down paint that you can control and do maybe two or three coats if necessary, but not obscure your detail and not deal with chunky areas that just don't look good on the miniature overall. I'm using that number three brush and I'm working this paint over the recessed areas, making sure it gets into all the little cracks and crevices. I want a good base coat and I want to let it dry completely and then assess and look and almost assuredly I'm going to do a second coat. Oftentimes you'll have a few areas that you missed. This is the easiest part of this whole process. It's a little bit tedious just because you do have to cover everything. You're probably asking why would you paint something that might not be yellow later on? Well every miniature is different and depending on what you might be painting, I'm doing several, several different battle mechs and to have a plan for 12 different ones and think ahead of time of what to paint what not to paint it's just easier to put yellow on everything and then i have the option of leaving it yellow or changing it to what i want because yellow is easy to paint over i'll continue with this coat let it dry and move on to the second the first coat is dry and now i'm ready to start the second you see i've started a second set of uh, paint here i don't want to put new paint on top of the old stuff just because it'll reactivate and you'll end up with little chunks it's just one thing that i wanted to mention I also wanted to say that that first coat I did was probably the thickest you would want to go with your first coat. As I was applying it, I realized it was probably just a little bit on the thicker side. And as I continued on, I added a little more water as I went, which wasn't seen on camera. The second coat is definitely going to be thinner. This is just going to even out those areas that you will see as soon as you look at your miniature after it's dried the variation underneath from the transparency of the paint. You'll see some darker spots and some brighter spots and that's just part of the reason why people think yellow is difficult to work with is that it requires more than one coat. The other thing that you'll most likely see are little bubbles. You can see them here or as you're painting as well and that's a consequence of thinning the paint. It's not a big deal as long as you're cognizant of the fact that you just need to go back and just take a, a brush that's mostly unloaded with paint and wick the bubbles away or just move the paint in a different area. So the way to deal with that is as you're painting, instead of getting to a point where you would reload your brush from your palette, go to the areas where you have some bubbles and redistribute that paint in areas that don't have any paint yet. And then at the end, you can use a paper towel, wick away any excess from your brush and then go around and do a cleanup. I tend to do both. If you wanted to do this with an airbrush, you're more than welcome to do that if you have the equipment available. I just wanted to show the brush techniques to be appealing to everyone regardless of the equipment. With the base coats dry, I've grabbed some of the soft tone wash and put in a cap here. I've also got my larger soft natural hair brush is what I like to use for washing. 
It's at 100% in the bottle cap here. I've got a paper towel handy as well to wick away any excess as I work. And I'm going to apply this soft tone wash directly to the model, making sure I cover every area, moving it around to prevent pooling and, and buildups too much. I'm also trying to avoid bubbles and uh, splashing and spattering and things like that. So it's not a hurried process. All you need to do is distribute the paint or the, in this case, the wash evenly over the entire model. I tend to start at the top and work my way down. As I hold the model, the paint will want to start to flow downward just due to gravity. As you come near finishing the wash, look over your model and start to move any of the areas that you don't want larger buildups, usually in the large surface areas. Wick it away on your paper towel or move it to a different area of the model. But I am looking to have a darker shadow on the underside, so I'm allowing it to build up on the bottom, as well as some of these areas with overhangs. The soft tone will mute out fairly well. It looks really good over yellow. I'm just making sure I don't have big, just, you know, puddles on some of these larger flat areas. If you get a tide pool mark, like what I've got here on this panel, you can pick up some more of your wash and then work the panel. I'm using very gentle pressure. What it's going to do is reactivate the wash medium. And then as I move the material away, you can see the tide mark is gone. And you can leave it as is. If it's gotten away from you a little bit, you can put more wash back on and smooth it out and then wick away the excess on a paper towel. Here you can see the Army Painter wash has dried and left a good amount of shadow in a lot of the recessed areas and underlying surfaces. There's a couple of spots on the back of the legs here and there that maybe I could have been more effective at avoiding pooling, but for my forces I actually have a bit of a weathered and worn look, so I'm okay with it. Just be aware that if you want to get rid of that, you can work that while you're still applying the wash. Before we begin dry brushing, I want to talk a little bit about paint consistency. The term dry brush doesn't mean you have to have the chalkiest, driest, crustiest paint out there that you can get on a brush and dry on a paper towel. I did say earlier you should avoid the airbrush mix paints that are pre-mixed ready for the airbrush just because some of the additives in there make this particular process a little bit trickier to do. I've taken paint straight from the bottle and I've added just a couple of brushfuls of water to thin this out. You can see the consistency as I drag it along. This is about what you would use to do the base coats that we did earlier. I don't want it any thicker than that. The reason being is it's much more likely to get that chalky and built up crusty texture on the miniature if you have it much thicker than this. You also don't want it super thin and runny because then you have a wet brush and that ends up, ends up causing streaking. I will be using this round makeup brush. It's about a quarter inch. You can get these just about anywhere they sell makeup products. And the reason I want to use this is the bristles are relatively soft. You've got a nice round domed surface so you can be very directional with the application of the paint and they're cheap so you can replace them easily once they get worn out. The first thing I do before I paint with a dry brush is I take my brush, load the bristles maybe an eighth of an inch or so, and immediately just take that off of the brush on a paper towel. I'm really not, not going to paint with any of this and the reason is, is I want to make sure the bristles are loaded with paint but I don't want to try to make this work right away. I tend to avoid having streaks or overloaded brush where I end up filling the cracks and crevices, which is what we're trying to avoid doing. Now I'll take my model, I'll reload my brush with just a bit of a stippling motion. I'm not trying to put too much paint into it. And on the paper towel, I'm really just getting rid of some of it, knowing that I'm leaving a decent amount of paint on the bristles and not what you would consider a traditional dry brush because I want a little bit, just ever so slight bit of streaking. And the reason I want this is I want to take some of those areas where I had talked about having some of this splotchy coffee staining and blend them out. I'm going to try to still go perpendicular or at the very least diagonally to any panel lines that I may have. And this is completely optional. You don't need to do this step. But I wanted to teach a, te a technique of dry brushing 
that kind of gets away from what most people associate when they think of dry brushing. So there's different ways to do it. As the brush gets a little bit drier, you'll start to notice it as you're applying the paint. I'll move on to doing just the edge highlights that you would traditionally do with a dry brush. As you get more experience with this, you'll start to see what the brush is doing with the paint as you apply it to the model. When I'm applying this paint, I initially try to do one layer over the entire model just to evenly distribute the overall panel highlights. I find that if I do the entire model first, then I can pick out the areas that were either missed the first time or focus on areas that I know definitely would have more of a brighter highlight or that were maybe missed by the wash and need just a little bit of extra attention. If you find areas that didn't get the wash completely on or it kind of pulled back a little bit and you ended up with some bare spots that are a little bit bright, you can touch them up at any point. Just take some of that wash, use a fine brush, and fill in some of the areas where it was a little bit under undercoated. The primary direction I'm gonna work is from the top to bottom, both in stroke as well as highlight emphasis. So I know this entire top area here is gonna have the most light, the tops of these arm barrels, the sides here. I'm probably not even gonna dry brush down in this area. But you're not constrict, con restricted to just one direction. Here, for instance, on these panels, I need to go a little bit of an angle just because I've got these deep recessed areas and I don't wanna keep going up and down too much because eventually they will get too much yellow on them and lose some of that shadow. So I can work diagonally here. I can work completely perpendicular down here and then back to angled both directions. And then in some areas, you're gonna to need to actually move in an upward direction. Try to limit that, but really it's whatever you think is going to look best. And as you apply the paint over the entire model, you'll see the highlights develop. But when you start to see a little bit of a buildup that potentially looks like chalkiness or a little too much paint kind of getting coagulated, double check the paint on your palette and also take a look and see how much paint you've applied in that area relative to the rest of the model. You might have already gone as far as you can go. I won't say that you can completely avoid any of the traditional dry brush effect where it looks a little bit chalky and maybe not as, as clean and, and smooth, but that's just one of the consequences of this process. However, I feel that the overall benefit and the look that's achievable if you take your time and are methodical and follow just a couple of these procedures that I'm trying to explain will really net you a great looking model especially once you have several of them all put together and on the table. I'll continue with this initial layer and then I'll take a look at the entire model and go back and touch up those higher areas that I want to have more of a highlight. As I'm finishing up this layer of yellow, I wanted to mention that the reason I'm using the makeup brush is that it really does allow this slightly streaky paint application to go easier. You can use a traditional dry brush if you wish. I just find that this rounded brush and this overall size helps with keeping it under a good amount of control. If your paint on your palette dries out, add some more paint and put it on a different area just so that you don't end up with any chunks building up or uh, bits of dried paint. That'll be kind of frustrating to deal with. And then finally, when I'm applying this paint, I'm not trying to smash it onto the model. I'm almost applying it as this makeup brush was intended in that if I was putting this on my face, not that I wear makeup, but I'm not trying to just hammer this home. I'm really using a gentle touch. And that'll also aid with not applying too much paint at once, especially if your paint's, again, a little bit damp on this traditional dry brush. If at any time you're not sure the consistency of your paint, maybe you had to add some water or you just poured some new paint, Use a spot, a blank spot on your base or maybe even on a piece of paper or something like that to test out and see how it's doing. You can also roll the brush between your thumb and forefinger to kind of get an idea of where there might be a little more paint on one direction than another. You'll get the feel for it as you practice more and more. But as you can see, I've done my initial coat. I've gone back and added some more highlights and a little bit of a heavier dry brush throughout. And I've got a result that I'm happy with. I poured out some ice yellow onto my palette. It, this paint is a little bit thinner than the previous yellow, so I'm not gonna add any water to it, and I'm not really wanting to do that streaky dry brush anyway, so it's not really necessary. This is gonna be closest to the original type of dry brushing that I was mentioning where you wanna have a drier paint, because we're really only just gonna catch the edge highlights. 
I'm gonna dry my brush on the paper towel just as you would normally and now I'm gonna definitely focus on just catching the outer edges of any of the top sides I'm using again light brush pressure initially I'm just going from top to bottom keeping things at least diagonal if not perpendicular to any panel lines once you've got that done look the model over and pick out areas that you either didn't catch the first time or that you want to emphasize this is a good time to maybe work some of those left and right type of brush strokes find some of those areas that need just a little bit more continue highlighting the model in this way until you're happy with the way the overall model looks to you as this is the last coat of yellow that this model is going to get. For this next step, you can take black, or in this case I'm using heavy charcoal, to pick out any areas that I intend to have be metallic. So I'm going to use steel on later or silver. And then anything I want to actually look like maybe rubber, like a, a seal or a jump jet port that's got a recessed area that I want dark. So you can see I've done the barrels if your miniature has some of these small little just openings that represent lasers or other weapons and you're not confident in your ability to put a little dot of paint in there, you can also take a black wash and take your brush and just put a little dot of wash in those. It might take two or three repetitions to get it darker, but it'll be a lot easier to clean up if you make a mistake. You can just use a paper towel to wash it away. You can see here now I've taken the gunmetal and gone over the black. I find that metallics do a lot better over a darker base coat. And I've touched up the joints in the arms and I'm just finishing now the cone on the back of the jump jet just to give a little bit of contrast and some color compared to the yellow on this scheme. Detail however you wish, what you're comfortable with or what you find most appealing. If you want to go in and do some silver over the gunmetal that could add even a little bit more of a visual pop. I also took a little bit of the charcoal and pre-darkened the cockpit glass in preparation for jeweling. You can see that I've added some silver and I've started to put a wash of Army Painter Soft Tone over the top of it to weather it a little bit. This Canopian unit uses silver accents so by just taking some silver and a little bit of the Army Painter Soft Tone wash that I used previously I can make that aged but worn look similar to what the yellow is without too much more effort. By all means, do whatever you're comfortable with in whatever scheme or unit that you're painting up. Once I'm completed with this, I'm going to go and jewel the cockpit and add some decals and finish the base. Here's the photograph of how it turned out. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. Leave your questions or comments in the section below. Follow us on Facebook at Battletech Camo Specs Online. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Shutdown sequence initiated.